Apologies for that. Uh, my name is Rich Katz. I'm going to be the moderator for today. Um, I'm here with an esteemed panel of professionals that are going to discuss um, how you can potentially shift um, liability for cyber incidents um, to vendors and suppliers. Um, this is becoming a much discussed topic <clears throat> in kind of the corporate world because um, not only are you required to manage um, the cyber risk of your own organization, um, but you also have to manage the cyber risk and exposure for the entities that you can con contract and do business with. So I'm going to introduce myself and then turn it to the panel for introductions, and then we'll get started. So my name is Rich Gatz again. Um, I'm a vice president head of cyber claims at Arch Insurance. Um, I'm also an attorney um, with a focus on cybersecurity, data privacy, and technology matters. And I guess we'll just go down the line. Cool. Uh, I'm Luca Grippa. I uh, am a software engineer and researcher at a cyber insurance company called Coalition. I spend my day-to-day -day analyzing vulnerabilities to see how we could better protect our policyholders and building insurance applications with artificial intelligence. I'm Jim Nettles, and so if you all probably heard this or heard from different things from me, there's a whole bunch of different me's in the stuff I do. Um, for sake of this, we're going to go back to most of what I've done in most of my career, which is in fin uh, financial technologies. Um, I've worked with some of the largest companies on the planet. I've also worked with a lot of startups. I do consulting. I've worked with VC firms and things like this. Um, in my daytime life, I have gone back to the insurance world, the insurance systems world. I have helped develop a lot of insurance products over the years. I have run a lot of cyber teams. Um, I've done a lot of consulting in the space. Uh, currently, one of the things I'm doing with one of our clients is helping to look at and develop international, um, basically, cyber programs for risk mitigation, risk management, cl insurance claims, and that space. So I'm very much on the risk side of things, and in purpose of this conversation, I'm actually going to pretend to be a professional. Hopefully, you won't have to pretend too hard. I'm Bill Buddington. I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation as a senior staff technologist. I've been uh, at EFF for 10 years. Previous to EFF, I was a web developer creating vulnerabilities. Um, and now I'm analyzing, well, mostly doing reverse engineering and uh, analyzing malware or, uh, or uh, uh, just apps for their other access of their privacy and security properties. Um, this involves a lot of looking at Android apps, uh, branching into looking at iOS apps as well. Um, so, uh, so kind of on the on the uh, vulnerabilities side, but also on the uh, uh, you know, actually dissecting the apps and looking at their properties, uh, reversing side. Awesome. So, <clears throat> real just quick, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to just walk up to the mic in the middle aisle. Okay, I want to make sure that we're answering questions while we're on that topic of discussion. And um, I don't know about the rest of the panel, I do like to talk. So I want to make sure that we have a lot of time to answer any questions you may have. So please feel free to ask ad hoc questions. We don't need to wait until the last 10 minutes where we might not have enough time to answer everyone's questions. Um, so to get started, I think we need to create a background foundational landscape of what is cybersecurity liability? Okay, and so from a legal perspective, okay, then I'm going to turn this over to a technology perspective, business owner consultant perspective. Liability is something where I am liable for either my acts, errors, or, or omissions to a third party. And that liability can arise in multiple ways. One is via contract. I promise to, for money that you give to me, to make sure that my networks don't get breached by a threat actor, which leads to downtime for your company, right? And most contracts don't say that. They basically say, hey, we're gonna keep your, your company up and running. Your uptime's gonna be 99.99% or whatnot. Um, but then you also have um, essentially like common law liability, right? So liability that you would see in absence of a contract. And what that is, is again, <clears throat> going back to an act error omission, the, the thing that most people know is negligence. Right, so I'm providing professional services to Luca, and I'm negligent in those professional services. I forgot to patch my on-prem Microsoft Exchange, okay, or you know, I have open RDP into your cloud environment, right? RDP is Remote Desktop Protocol. 
So that liability can arise in multiple ways. And what we're going to discuss on this panel in part is, you know, how you can you know, shift that liability. Now, the shifting of liability is very difficult when it comes to like a common law perspective. And the reason for that is, is that you actually need to have a negligent act. You need to have some type of violation of a law or duty to have that liability incurred. Contractual liability is a little bit easier to shift. And there's caveats to that, like we can talk about limitation liability provisions and things like that in contracts. But because you're actually explicitly delineating the contractual relationship between two parties, if one party violates that contract, then the other, you know, that party typically is liable. Now, I want to first turn it over to Jim. In your experience, right, are you typically seeing um, liability for cybersecurity on the, and, and, I look at things from like a data privacy perspective. So I look at like controllers of data and processors of data. If anyone's familiar with the GDPR, that's kind of what they do. Yeah, mm. GDPR. So, um, so if you're the entity that is trying to maintain that uptime and you're you know technically liable to your customers, mm -hmm. right? But there is a potential other entity that actually was the cause or source of the incident. Like in your experience, Jim, how what what's what, what are the issues um, these companies are facing with that type of um, cyber incidents? So let's actually talk about some of the biggest cyber risks we actually see in the industry. The first of which, I mean, we we all like to have this picture of the kid hiker in the or hacker in the basement, you know, going Shall wearing we play a hoodie, a game? Mm -hmm. wearing a hoodie, yeah, have to wear a hoodie, wearing a hoodie, and I'm part of anonymous da da da. da. Much of what we deal with are one of two big, or well, one of three large challenges. The first of which is state actors. Cybersecurity locks really only keep out the honest and the lazy. Um, and so if someone is targeting you, has some resources, they will breach. Now, it's... We, we see a lot more intelligence. This is a lot more mature process than it used to be. It's now up to the ability of being a toddler. Most system admins no longer leave the admin and default password of blank or password on the system. The greatest vulnerabilities we tend to see happen come not necessarily from systemic problems. We can fix lots of bugs if you quit introducing them. Um, <laughs> We, we can fix and play whack-a-mole because ultimately if somebody can access something for le legitimate reasons, there's something that somebody screwed up that leaves a vulner vulnerability. This is still not where the majority of incidents actually come from. Anybody like to guess? People. People. Systems work really well if it weren't for all the damn people. Um, the frequency with which human human interactions because somebody calls and says, hey, yeah, this is the president of the company. I need X right now. And people do not take the time to question it or other ways of human sourcing of breach and vulnerability. We deal with a lot of state actors. I mean, very famously, think about things like North Korea and, Korea and Sony. If somebody has resources and is intending to attack you, you're going to have a bad day no matter what you do. So that's part of the reason for these products is because ultimately, if somebody storms the walls for long enough, the walls are going to fail. Yeah, but Jim, so what are the obligations that that vendors have? So, so let's talk about those obligations. There's a reasonable level of defense, right? Because the way that cybersecurity has come about, the reason I laid that out is because the obligations come up beyond to the level of what are the reasonable standards based on what I am trying to defend. So if I am a small business company, you know, I'm a small business, I, you know, I'm selling some products and things like that, and I go and I use Cloudflare, manage stuff on the websites and things like that, and uptime and use some basic services, their level of standards are going to be much lower than you're working for an international banking system. You're working for an international financial company. You're working for Amazon, right? So if you're a vendor or you're doing government services, the standard and level you're going to be held to is going to be different depending on what you're securing, what the risk is, what the value is, and ultimately what the potential damage is. 
right? So if somebody breaks in and they manage to steal and find out, you know, all the names of a given customer system out of a healthcare system. They get all the names, they know who's who's insured. That's what they get. That's really not that that difficult to to deal with. If they break in and get all of your social security numbers and dates of birth, we have a much larger vulnerability here. We have a much larger problem. So the, one of the biggest concerns we have to look at is what's the size of the organization? What's the data we're protecting? And that is really where the key is, is what are people going after? State actors and criminal organizations are both looking for the same sorts of data. Because generally even state actors are either looking to disrupt somebody's business operations or they are looking to go pilfer or blackmail or use things that they can put on the market to go make revenues. So let me direct a question to Luca and maybe Bill, you can jump in as well. <clears throat> so a vendor and supplier, right? So we can think of that as being incredibly broad. I mean, technically almost every company is a vendor or supplier to someone, right? So Luca, in your experience as a security analyst, what type of kind of IOCs or indicators of compromise, access vectors, things like that, are you seeing in like the supply chain? rather than you know focused against uh, like the, the network of a large company hmm. something that's really interesting is there this is a, a little more rare i would say but something interesting that happens every once in a while is uh one of these government organizations will actually identify a breach in a company before they even know and they'll mm. notify them right and that's that's when things get really interesting but i would say i mean mostly what's happening is you know these suppliers and vendors are um, distributing a product that people use to store their data a lot of times or share files and vulnerabilities come out whether when they're really bad they're zero days and they in the case of move it we were talking about uh, last night right clop had this zero day vulnerability and move it for a really long time and, and just so if, if for people that aren't aware move it is essentially a file transfer protocol or platform as a service that was used by hundreds and hundreds of companies um, to secure confidential or sensitive information between you know the company and whoever they were sending it to a ransomware threat, act threat actor group by the name of CLOP that's a CL0P um, basically got access to this protocol and sat there for two years and stole a bunch of people's data. Yeah so in that situation it was pretty bad where they actually identified all these vulnerable um, companies before anybody else even knew about the vulnerability and then they kind of started attacking and they already had their list no that's yeah that's great and does everybody know what a zero day vulnerability is good point or does anybody not i saw a couple of head shakes no so go go for it a zero day vulnerability is a vulnerability that has not yet been uh, discovered by the manufacturer or discovered by the software uh, writer and so they have exactly zero days to fix it um, so it's been reported to them, uh, uh, but it has not been yet fixed. Uh, that is a zero day vulnerability or maybe it hasn't even been reported to them. Yeah, no. And, and so that really is, and, and that's a great point, Luca and, and Bill, but, you know, thinking about vendor liability, right, is, okay, what are you using a vendor for or a supplier? Is it for data services? Is it for cloud storage services? Is it part of your like business model? right? Like, are you using some, you know, CRM or ERM or whatever it might be? Um, you know, I've, I've dealt with a lot of claims with professional firms, so law firms and accountants firms, where the software product that they use, their SaaS product they use to manage their business gets hit, right? And what's terrible is a lot of these companies, I mean, I've heard this so many times, we just went paperless like three months ago. And they transferred everything over and the company that they essentially store their business on is now hacked. And one of the issues that I want to talk to about today too is, you know, what do you do when the company that you're contracting with your supplier or vendor doesn't have cyber insurance, doesn't have liquid funds to actually deal or, or negotiate a ransom, right? And so many times, and, and that's why it's important you need to mitigate your own risk as a company. Um, because a lot of times your vendors and suppliers don't have the ability to actually help you after a cyber incident. Yes, ma'am. I'm too short. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel you, me too. Yes. Uh, I may not be asking this que question correctly. I'm not that seasoned in this area. 
I recently heard that there was an executive order where a government organization was requiring their vendors to provide a software bill of materials to make sure that they had certain security protocols in place before they did business with that vendor. What do you think about other companies from now on requiring the software bill of materials just to make sure that their vendor cybersecurity is where it needs to be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for, I'll, I'll just touch on that from like a insurance claims and legal perspective, reactive perspective. Um, anything that is going to help strengthen your controls and help defray potential loss due to a cyber incident, I think is helpful. I think that there's always going to be an inflection point of um, overregulation, right? Like if you have like a seesaw and it's like, all right, no regulation, overregulation. I think we're still very underregulated in tech space. And the government with DOD contracts, other federal contractees are, are trying to fix that. Um, but unless it, you know, and again, Typically, the companies that are contracting with governmental entities aren't small. They're larger, more sophisticated. So they could bear that burden. Now, what, and I think, and I want other people to comment on this too, but what I think is going to be interesting is when the federal government says, we're banning all ransomware payments as illegal. Because right now, there's some state governments that are banning ransomware payments if a municipality or other governmental entity in that state gets hit. So to your point, yeah, we might have some regulation to say, all right, uh, mandatory notification time of 24 to 72 hours, or, you know, hey, you need to comply with NIST or all this stuff. Um, that seems to me to be okay. But I think where the rubber is going to meet the road is, is when they're like, yeah, you know what? Ransomware payments are illegal. You can't make them. So. In a federal context, it's, uh, you know, in CISA, CISA is bringing up the Bill of Materials. Uh, and CISA is the right. governmental entity that's basically cyber like security, uh, focused on cybersecurity and, 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 security and they're real, doing really good stuff. Yeah, they're a uh, public interest based organization. They're uh, trying to, well, from the government's per perspective, make what, uh, you know, public interest decisions. And one of the um, calls is for Bills of Material for critical infrastructure, making sure that there are safeguards and proper uh, properties that are being uh, adhered to when as a vendor is uh, or a, a software developer is developing uh, software that's going to be run on critical infrastructure, SCADA systems, etc. And so that's uh, something that is is extremely important and, um, and I think that you know um, as a, it often works into, for instance, um, acquisition, uh, uh, and the role of acquisition of, you know, of, uh, of you know, uh, systems and software and hardware, um, knowing that those systems are, are secure and are not uh, perhaps Trojaned and, uh, and malicious, going to be acting maliciously, uh, especially in the, uh, the context of critical infrastructure, that's extremely important. Yeah, the, the thing, I, here's the thing I throw in on this, because, and again, a lot of the work I've done has been risk mitigation, business continuity, disaster recovery, planning. So when we look at cyber events, this is one of those things that organizations are always running behind on because DR planning is one of those things that is a massive challenge. Nobody wants to spend money. I mean, uh, let's be honest, Insur you, when you buy insurance, whether it's for your car, your house, your corporate entity, what you're doing is you're gambling that something isn't going to go wrong, but I'm paying money to help offset something when it does. It's risk mitigation. It is risk mitigation, and it is transfer of risk, which we're talking about. When I look at plans from vendors, when we assess vendor contracts, because so much stuff is now SaaS products, right? So much of what we do is no longer hosted within companies. It's hosted on an Amazon. It's hosted on larger platforms. There is a lot more when you interact with a vendor about than just their one platform. So, for example, what I work with currently is a SaaS platform. We offer a lot of SaaS products, but we also interface with a lot of other platforms. So if something fails, it could be us. It could be one of the platforms we use to host everything on. It could be an API where somebody calls in. There are literally hundreds of potential gateways into any significantly sized organization just because we move data back and forth. Right. So from a BC and a DR standpoint, one of the things that we now try to ask for is not only about do you have a continuity and an up plan for us, it's are you also now, what is your plan in the event that there is a breach that is in your area of responsibility? 
Um, and now it's pushing more towards there being insurance of products that are available to help secure these very specific kinds of events because for a long time there was a large argument it was either inclusionary or exclusionary for a data event if you had a breach. First question? So obviously like uh, there's a major difference between compliance and security. Right. And so given the legal frameworks and the legal understanding uh, of security and that continuing to develop in terms of the threat landscape, how do you guys square that with, you know, now the legal ramifications for CISOs who are at the wheel when incidents occur, right? Like, because ransomware payments could be made illegal, but now negligence cases are being brought against CISOs of right. publicly traded companies. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the first thing that I would say is um, directors and officers of a company, which is typically the C-suite, are actually potentially personally liable for their actions or inactions as a director and officer of the company. This is why you have DNO insurance. Okay. Like I can sue the chief executive officer, the chief, you know, information security officer personally and say, your decision caused damage to this company. All right. And they're liable for that. Now companies defray that risk by getting a DNO policy that provides indemnity, right? For that. So, um, I assume you're referring to the Uber case for people that are not here. Uber CISO essentially um, hit a bunch of shit and was basically found criminally negligent for how they responded to a breach. And so to your question, I would say in my mind, and people may disagree with me, I think CISOs have always had this risk. The difference is is that generally you don't have the legal and, and regulatory obligations as a company um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, right? Like we've only had 50 privacy regulatory statutes and 50 states worth of privacy regulatory statutes for a couple of years. There's a couple of states, I think Alabama and somewhere else that they were holdouts until a couple of years ago, right? So if you go back 20 years ago, there were not a lot of like privacy obligations. Like if you, if you had a data breach of your customer information that includes social security numbers and things like that, there wasn't a lot of legal framework for you to actually be held accountable for. So I think what we're seeing is kind of the, the tip of the spear, so to speak. And CISOs, you know, if a CEO is responsible for the business direction and has duties of loyalty, um, duties of good faith, right, on behalf of the company, I think those are going to be, you know, the CISO has the same thing. And if the CISO does that and, and lies to regulators, right, then they... I, I think they should be held criminally liable for it. Uh, thank you, but also the overlap to supply chain. I knew you were going to say that. Um, yeah, but I mean, and that's very true, right? And and I think, you know, talking about shifting liability, number one, if you're dealing with a regulator, don't effing lie to them, all right? <laughs> like, it's, it's kind of simple, right? Like, hey, we had this data breach, and it was X, Y, and Z. Don't be like, ah, nah, bro, this is good. We're good. Everything's good. You know? Because then, then you're in trouble, right? Like, don't lie on your taxes. Don't lie to the FTC, right? Don't lie to the government when they're investigating a cyber incident. Um, but the thing is, is as, you know, I think Jim mentioned, given how everything is built on other people's platforms, right? I think it's going to be very important to make sure, like, you outline the contractual obligations of your vendors and suppliers and also that you have provisions in that contract that says, hey, you have a duty to notify, right? GDPR, CCPA, right? If you're a data processor, right? If you're not the ones that own that data, typically I think GDPR is you need to notify the data owner without undue delay, right? And so as we're seeing, at least in the United States, increases in, in or I should say decreases in the time frame that you need to notify um, law enforcement and the government of a cyber incident, um, you need to make sure that your vendors are complying with that as well. And possibly in the EU as well with the Cyber Resilience Act coming up. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, the EU is on the leading forefront of this, which um, is both cool because I'm a privacy by design guy, but also frustrating because then we get to see my entire industry just overreact for like years at a time. <laughs> like <laughs> leading up to the GDPR, I literally thought everyone was on like cocaine because it was just absolute insanity. <laughs> Question? Yeah. Hey, how are you guys doing? Thanks for coming and talking Good. to us. No, thanks uh, for like your hat. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jesse, and I'm curious if y'all guys had any um, opinion on if you think 
that companies are being properly incentivized to do security work. Um, I, cause you know, there are multiple times where the d balance between security and having an effective product, it's not necessarily going to, you might have to sacrifice on some security to get a prototype. And then so all of right. a sudden here come customers saying, Oh, well, we want this thing now. And you have to be able to go back and say, you really don't want this thing right. now. Yeah. I mean, it's um, the age old <laughs> question of, um, you know, put it in prod and make it perfect <laughs> you know is it perfect or is it in production right yeah. and um that's something that i see a lot in the claims that that come in um in that almost universally they'll get either an email compromise or mm -hmm. a ransomware attack or something like that and it's like oh we were going to update everything two weeks ago but we needed to <laughs> we needed it for the sales yeah. budget but bill mm -hmm. did you have a comment yeah, I just wanted to kind of add to those. You know, it depends on the type of company. Like, mm -hmm. if it is a vendor or a supplier or a writer of software, too. Um, earlier this year, uh, uh, President Biden released a statement saying that there's going to be a new regulatory regime that's targeting software writers and the companies that write software, not open source. They, you know, explicit carve out for open source developers. Mm -hmm. um, that's interesting but um i'll tell you a story a little small anecdote i was looking at a, a android smart tv created by rock chip uh, a t95 and it's a small uh, a chinese device that produced you know it has uh, an, a version of an outdated version of android android 9 that cannot be updated and uh, start looking at the network traffic of it and lo and behold, it's reaching out once you add your network credentials to a random seven character <laughs> dot com domain. Nice. And, um, uh, you know, you don't even have to do anything. You are automatically at your for your convenience added to a botnet <laughs> once you boot that device up. No configuration needed. Um, so, um, you know, and it was Amazon that I bought that device from. And uh, notifying Amazon of it gets rid of that device from their product lineup for a short time, and then they relist it. And it's continuing to be sold on Amazon. There's a kind of vendor situation where the vendor, I think, should be liable because the producer cannot be held liable because it's not within the U.S.'s regulatory power to uh, sanction a company within China. And, so, and, and that's a good point that I want to table for later. We might forget it. But do you, how does liability shift when you have knowledge of a vendor or supplier? being you know at fault for something well so looking at things from a, a business perspective right i'm going to go look one of the things that we like to do is to find those people that do something well especially where we have our greatest liability you know payment processors especially right so if i can maintain just a bare minimum of data about my customers and then connect and store all that financial data on a much more secure platform where i don't have to worry about that I've by default shifted a lot of my liability there from a data perspective. Mm -hmm. From a product liability perspective and having done business with Chinese vendors, uh, you know, things like that, um, and understanding how that environment works as well as a lot of other producers. Uh, like we were talking about the other day, you know, there have been numerous incidents, Huawei, other systems where we know that the chipsets have back doors in them that are being shipped here. And that equipment is throughout companies, throughout government, throughout homes. And all you can really do is go and say, oh, well, chunk it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at things from a, but from a pure business perspective, it's sometimes it's a small cost uplift. It's that additional cost that saves a lot of the other potential liabilities and liability costs when you do a risk assessment but like how do you and i think this kind of goes to the heart of your question mm -hmm. how do you influence senior level stakeholders to so, say hey this might happen this was kind of going to be a follow-up so if, if we do this it might not happen but i can't promise you it's not going to happen yeah i was also going to ask what y'all would think about how would we go about incentivizing those so, people in ways that we haven't yeah, before, besides like, just forming a union and right. all saying we're only going to work you, you on I mean, you threatened the CISO at jail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, I think Rich would agree with me on this, but honestly, cyber insurance is kind of a perfect player in helping to hold some of these, uh, you know, vendors and suppliers accountable. Because what happens on our end 
is through all this claims data that we're analyzing and seeing, we're seeing which products are like uh, kind of are or more, or which products that are customers use that are more likely to claim, right? And then our, pro our customers start to step away from these products. So when now when people are not using their products, they come to us like, why are you telling people that our products aren't secure? It's because they right? suck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just like if you're so, a shitty driver. If you're stop a shitty, using yeah. Fortinet VPNs if you're a shitty driver, for the love of God, goes up. please. If you're a shitty yeah. software writer, your premium for cyber insurance goes well, up. Well, well and, exactly. and that's the thing. Like, that's the application that's process for cyber insurance, because of all the post-COVID increase in severity and frequency of claims, is pretty robust, and, right? And that's where there's two things I was going for that help lead to this. Number one are the security assessments. So if you're going to be covered by the policy, we're going to do a risk threat assessment, right? It may be done with white hat hackers. It may be done with audits, things like this. I'm working on a product or we're working on a thing right now with a company that, you know, uses a number of different tools that do a map and do a risk assessment of your technology landscape. But the other thing, the other way to get cybersecurity in is to prove the reality of the threat. My wife used to be um, director of um, DR and infrastructure for a Fortune 50 company. And the way that she got a budget to get DR started within the organization was she went and pulled out pictures of Hugo as the reason to create backup power for a core provider of services. Are you talking about Hurricane Hugo? I am talking about Hurricane Hugo. Okay. I thought maybe there was a random person named Hugo that was like <laughs> no, breaking Disney hard drives. Named Hugo too. I thought the, the floppy ear Disney yeah. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> he, He's also a great risk. Yeah. Um, but Hurricane Hugo tore up a whole lot more than anybody ever thought it could. And as we're watching weather events come, by proving that a risk is real and showing how real that risk is and showing who's been vulnerable and eaten, by the problem, um, that's the way you go and say, well, we can spend $100,000 or we can lose $20 million when right. this happens. Yeah, and that's something that I always say a lot because I do a lot of broker meetings where we're trying to onboard insureds or, or sell our, our product, right? And I always ask them, like, do you guys use computers? And they say, yes. I'm like, okay, you wake up one morning, every single computer doesn't work. Every single server is unavailable, and every single file is encrypted on the file level. Your backups are no good, right? How, what would that do to your business, right? And so, to Jim's point, making the risk real, I think, is, is really important. Sir? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm, I actually work in CyberSec. I'm a Splunk engineer for my company. The question I have is, is that I've been working on I've been working on a master's degree, and we did a case study of a smaller non-emergency medical transport company here in Georgia, and taking a look at their infosec structure, that it's all over the board. But the question, um, after looking at the information that we were provided, they are big enough to have an in-house team which consists of two SOC analysts, but they're going with an MSSP providing their technology for security monitoring. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, if you have a situation where a vendor misses something because of a bug, whatever it may be, but you have that MSSP mixed into it, where is the ri or where is the liability going to be shifted? I, I would say on both. And so, you know, MSSPs actually have a very difficult time getting cyber insurance. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of scope creep over the years, like, you know, an MSSP should only be a managed service provider for like one little thing. But all of a sudden they're like, oh, we do incident response. We do eyes on glass sock. We do all this stuff. And narrator, they don't do it well. I mean, the case, right? <laughs> well, in the case of that study, though, they actually had separate cyber insurance that wasn't being provided through the MSSP. Right. Yeah. So, no, and, and, and that's great. And, and I can tell you that. Every cyber insurance has something called a subrogation provision, which says um, if there's essentially if there's another entity that's liable for loss that's paid out on the policy, you will give your rights to the cyber insurance carrier to go after them. And we've gone after MSSPs. Like, for instance, I had one claim um, where an MSSP was supposedly trying to, to do like a managed like EDR process, right? Supposedly had a SOC, eyes on glass, all this stuff. And they saw cobaltstrike.exe. And uh, for those that don't know, it's essentially a 
a program that gives you command and control access of a network, essentially. Luca, you can maybe talk about it a little bit more in a second. But um, it's actually used by some sysadmins, like in a white hat way, like in, a, in an actual way. But it's also something that's always a red flag. And so this MSSP said, oh, yeah, uh, this can be used for good. So it must be being used for good. Never reached out to the insured to say, hey, do you guys deploy Cobalt Strike on your environment? And guess what? They got hit by Conti. And they were ransomed for one point two five million dollars. So, you know, the, the 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 transfer of liability is very well and alive, but with an MSSP relationship, it's almost always done by contract, right? And those limitation liability provisions can be pretty egregious. For instance, I have a claim actually in Georgia where the MSSP somehow negotiated uh, the limit of their liability is three months of their service fees. Okay, and they got hit by ransomware, and the the company was down for three weeks, and they lost four hundred thousand dollars a day for doing nothing wrong. So, Just similar to, similar question. So, been in the system integrator world for a couple decades, right? And there's right. How do we how do we shift the liability to the software manufacturers or hardware manufacturers? Is one bucket, right? And typically, the companies are buying products through an integrator, right? There's somebody in the middle that's putting systems together or software together to deliver a, you know, boxed product to the customer. Are you seeing liability shifting to an integrator that's not even, we don't even claim to do anything security-wise, right? But we put it all together. So where is the liability on that kind of company? This is kind of comes up in the auto, you know, debate. Yeah. Like exactly this kind of okay, who should hold the responsibility mm -hmm. uh, when a car crashes? This debate came up in the '50s and the '40s when auto manufacturers were putting together uh, dangerous products, and then regulators started thinking, okay, well, who is the lowest cost? Uh, uh, who is the uh, point in the production or who is the lowest cost of, of fixing this vulnerability and, or uh, uh, gross negligence uh, in terms of uh, the auto manufacturers at the time. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be those that sell the finished, you know, put together the finished product um, in some cases. I, th I don't think that it should necessarily be uh, a... Uh, factor of uh, of uh, negligence because, uh, for instance, in the auto manufacturer's case, uh, negligence. Um, so, if you're talking about negligence versus uh, versus uh, you know uh, just complete uh, liability for for any uh, so complete you know there's a high stakes exa extremely high stakes. Uh, uh, game when it comes to auto manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, it has to be uh, explicit. Uh, uh, you know, and not some some higher bar like negligence, because um, you know the, the people's lives are on the line. Yeah, and this is kind of where, if you ever heard the term product defect litigation, right? And so, if you look at, all right, my company makes widgets, all right, and the widgets, I don't know, speak at Dragon Con, and so another company though takes that widget and puts another widget on it the integrator, mm -hmm. right? And then it gets sold to a retailer who then sells it, okay? And product liability, and which it will be the same for you know any type of negligent argument or things like that, you look at the chain of custody, you look at the distribution, and you look at who was the one that actually, you know, it's called proximate causation. The, the typical, you could basically say, but for this act, this loss wouldn't have occurred, right? And so my answer to your question from a legal perspective is, is if the integrator did not create the act error or remission, right? Like if you did not put things together the wrong way, right? Then you wouldn't be liable, right? Now it would go to, okay, well, who left this back door in, right? It depends like, on how you define what's wrong, right? Right. Well, and, and, it, and if it's, I have knowledge of it, well, it still and, went in. Well, that's the thing, yeah. though. I mean, you can't be... From a, from like a legal theory perspective, um, negligence you don't have to have knowledge for. Okay, like either you did an act error or omission, right, or you didn't act or error, or you omitted the or you, you failed to find a, an issue, right? Like, and it goes to like a reasonable standard of care standard, right? Like, uh, ISIT integrator in your jurisdiction that does similar things, would they have caught this error? 
right? You put expert witnesses on the stand and things like that to say, well, no, this was closed code. We had no idea this existed. They gave us a, essentially a finished product that we then attached to another finished product in accordance with the guidelines we were provided. There was no way for us to, to figure out the error. But if it was like, hey, a reasonable, you know, ITIS integrator in a similar space in the similar industry would have been like, huh, this has port 3830 open uh, to the internet and it's not behind any MFA or VPN or anything, whatever it is, I'm making shit up. But you know what I mean? Like if, if you were to, if, if a reasonable entity or person with your expertise would have found the error, then you're potentially liable. But so is the entity that actually created that error in the first place. My point was, uh, you know, for for the software liability manufacturers of cars versus, you know, there sometimes it is as high stakes as as a car. For instance, if it's a medical device, and firmware that goes into a medical device has to adhere to the highest standards, uh, you know, a standard of strict liability, and uh, and not negligence because, um, well, okay, if it's only if someone is grossly negligent, then um, you know they're not going to be held. That's and, not and as good real of a quick, standard. I want you to finish that thought, but I just want to explain what strict liability is okay because there's a difference there are two separate legal standards between negligence and strict liability strict liability basically means that um, there's a presupposition that you're liable okay the classic example is if you're on a plane and it crashes all right the airline has to prove that they didn't make a mistake all right you're technically strictly liable uh, if you have a pacemaker okay, or some other type of medical device, and it fails, the company that made it is going to be strictly liable, right? They're going to have to say, no, there is actually something else that caused this. And essentially, the burden of proof for that liability shifts from the person that suffered the injury to the company or entity that actually made the product or provided the service. But I don't think there's, there's a one-size-fits-all solution for software when it comes to liability. I think that uh, you know a medical pacemaker device with firmware embedded in it uh, should be held to a different standard than, yeah, say, um, some uh, indie video game. This is why software contract attorneys get paid so much money. Yeah, you know, and you know the indie video game, uh, you know, vulnerability. The the maker of the indie video games business shouldn't be put out of business just because uh, it has a vulnerability in the software. Um, so the, so those are different standards, right? Right. And, much and, different stakes. Yeah, and one of the other things we're seeing much more of is the demand for testing and certification that you've put at least a reasonable level level of effort and security into your vendors, your API tests, are your very, you know, so have you made a reasonable effort to investigate those things that you may not necessarily be in your control, but which you're leveraging and using for the business purpose? Right. Yeah, I think uh, software development and this whole idea of negligence is kind of difficult because similar to what you said, Bill, right? Like maybe it depends on the product because I mean, you know, Facebook or, or Meta, as they're called now, has this saying, move fast and break things, right? Like, that's kind of how software development works. And maybe there should be different standards for different products, but also, you don't want to stifle innovation. And what happens when, you know, somebody was mo a company was moving really fast to actually come out with a security patch, and then they introduce another one, but they had to go quick because they were trying to protect people. I feel like it's kind of a fine line, and it'll be interesting to see kind of how, you know, maybe some of these cases play out if they ever get taken to court or something. Yeah, defending innovation is extremely important. And, you know, for the auto manufacturer's liability, going back to that, but not to beat a dead horse too much, but um, they, you know, in general have bottomless pockets um, versus, well, you know... So it's uh, the, the Fight Club issue, right? right? <laughs> like... Yeah. The, you know, you guys seen Fight Club where he's on the plane describing like the car, you know, like, hey, you know, we take the, the amount of settlements that we would potentially pay out due to this fire risk uh, versus the cost of a recall. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to like innovation. But I mean, I would argue that if, you know, one of the good things about working in cybersecurity uh, is very rarely is it going to cause people's deaths. Um, we did have an individual that died due to a ransomware attack in a hospital in Germany. And I'm sure that there's going to be more. Um, but, you know, it's not, hey, I'm in the car with my family of five and it started on fire and, you know, you didn't have fun. But yet. Yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> Did you want to go with your question, please? Sure. Um, hi, I'm a cybersecurity architect for a bank you've all heard of and probably a lot of you use. So this is very relevant to my work. Um, I have a question about liability, how it's balanced with when what's really liable is your fourth or fifth party. Um, 
how if you have a if you have a contract with your third party, uh, how do you do you sue the third the third your third party or that fourth or that fifth party even? So um, one of the basic legal principles is something called privity, mm -hmm. and what that means is that in order to have the ability to seek damages from someone, there needs to be some type of relationship. So privity, in a layman's term, would be like a relationship. You can have contractual privity, which means I contracted with you for S services or goods. And um, if you didn't provide those or you breached the contract, I can now sue you under that contract, right? Now there's other, um, you know, like common carrier liability, right? If you're on a bus, right? Or negligent liability. Like if someone commits a negligent act against you, you the, the relationship is really that they allegedly committed negligence that injured you, right? So the issue with business law is if you don't have contractual privity, right, and if you weren't the, the entity that was specifically damaged, then you might not be able to bring a suit against them. Now, this does get a little bit complicated because you do have some legal avenues such as like a third party beneficiary to a contract, right? So with your hypothetical, you know, Company A provides widgets, company B provides cloud storage for those widgets, company C provides managed security services for those widgets, and you're just purchasing the widgets to sell to your company, to, to your customers, right? If the third entity failed, even though you don't have contractual relationship or anything like that, you could say, well, hey, I'm a beneficiary under the contract between these two separate entities, and I was damaged, so I'm going to sue you. Okay. But um, really, it, it depends. And I have seen situations where um, entities are relying upon a, a vendor or supplier that they do not have a contract with, and they're basically SOL when it comes to seeking any type of recompense from them. Okay, thank you. Um, name's Courtney, just a regular curious person. Hi. A simple question, really kind of. Um, does it seem like most of these are international companies and if so are they just asking for dollars to let your companies be able to start back to work or does it seem like it's um any other kind of um you know like crypto or what have you and also as a regular individual person schmuck uh, do we need to, be, need to be concerned about our money or like health data or um you know social security you know identity stuff yeah i mean I I, ideally I, no but you, <laughs> right now yes you do have to be yeah. concerned about it because there's not you know as uh, as rich mentioned earlier there's not just not a like good regulatory regime uh in cyber for cyber security right now and it's up to the consumers to look into the products that they're buying currently in order to ensure that they the company that they're buying from isn't doesn't have a horrible security reputation for instance right yeah i mean i i call it like winning the bad luck lottery um when when shit hits the fan um just because i've handled hundreds of data breaches um if not thousands at this point and i think i've only had two or three where the data that was stolen actually led to um like an actual damage on behalf of the individual okay um, part of that is is because there's been a massive shift in cybersecurity incidents from data breaches to ransomware, okay? Because data's cheap. I mean, frankly, if you have had a credit record since, you know, before the Equifax breach, I could probably look up your social security number in about five minutes, okay? Um, it's, you know, people that, I mean, you, you don't even need to pay for it now. You can probably download the, the Equifax database for free, database for free on the dark web right now, okay? And that was, you know, 250 million US individuals and others, right? So my thing is, is like, you know, I hate to use the term like trust, but verify, right? But make sure you're monitoring your credit, make sure that, you know, I, I freeze mine on all three service providers. And then if I need to open it up, then I'll open it up. And then I turn it off when I don't. But generally, in my experience, you know, handling insurance claims for very large and very small companies, I very, very rarely see the individual consumer um, impacted outside of their information being stolen. 
Um, it's really just, hey, if we're going to get into a system, we want to encrypt data, exfiltrate the data, and then try to get a big payout for the company rather than say, hey, I'm going to take your social security number and try to get unemployment fraud for like $5,000. Sorry, me again. Um, <laughs> so this, I have not seen this in the cybersecurity space, but I've seen this in the accounting space where Basically, there was a breach, and they not only went after the person responsible, they went after the auditors for not seeing the, light, the, seeing the issue beforehand. Now, I have seen companies contract out to um, get external penetration tests and internal vulnerability tests. Have you seen an instance where not only did the company go, um, go after the software, go after the vendor that had the issue, but also went after their own auditors and said, you should have found this? Absolutely. 100%, you know, because you have to think about, um, again, going back to that privity question, okay, when, when companies have been damaged, one of the first things they do is they're like, who can I sue? Okay, and, you know, hey, if you've been truly damaged, I think it's a perfectly cromulent question, right? Like, if you've been damaged, try to get as much recovery as you can. And attorneys, accountants, have you know specific professional duties to their customers that a lot of other vendors don't have right even in the absence of a contract right if i'm providing legal services to you we now have a relationship we're in privity right and same with an accountant if they're you know they have a duty of good faith and a duty a fiduciary duty to maintain your information and keep you from being damaged so i can tell you that um not in the cybersecurity space but one of the I guess kind of, but one of the largest claims I ever dealt with was a uh, town controller in Illinois, it's a pretty famous case, basically stole like $60 million over like 10 years from this little town. Why they had $60 million, I don't know. Um, but ultimately, um, a large accountants firm audited them every year, never found the issue. Guess who ended up paying the loss? The accountants firm. So cybersecurity, same thing. Like if you're um, in a relationship with a company and your services that you're providing are to safeguard them, if you fail to do that, you at the very least have a good faith allegation to bring a lawsuit. Thank you. No, thank you. So um, great questions. Thank you guys so much for participating. We have about six minutes left. I guess what I want to do is kind of go to you three and what can a company do, in your opinions, to shift that cybersecurity liability to a vendor or a supplier? We'll start with you, Luca. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but you know, coming from my experience, uh, cyber insurance is definitely a way to, you know, shift that risk. And making sure that the supplier and vendor has cyber insurance, right, that well. and that you would be an insured under that policy. Yeah, definitely. But that is definitely something that is we've seen to help and um, like I was saying before I think it's a real cyber insurance providers are, are in a good place to apply the pressure to the vendors and hopefully just build this better ecosystem so that the suppliers can be more secure and we can have less claims overall and security breaches no that's great and I will add that some cyber insurance providers will actually do kind of outside in scans where they'll look at your publicly available domain information and things like that and they can also do that on vendors and suppliers and there's publicly available tools and whatnot to, to do that and so you know part of it is you know potentially you know leveraging those tools to kind of understand the threat landscape for your vendor supplier Jim yeah beyond having insurance and making sure your vendors have insurance is really understanding what are the things that your business does what are the things that you need to keep in house? What things are proprietary? And then determining what are those things that can be moved to trusted services so that you're only dealing with the things that are within your knowledge and your expertise. So one, again, one of the biggest things we often look at is that, that money side, the payments data, right? Uh, if you can offload, and I see this in companies of all sizes, if you can take and move the billing and financial transaction, uh, transactional side of stuff, PCI compliance, all that kind of stuff off to a vendor that that's what they do and that's where their liability is. You know, it's that idea of using vendors where their expertise is to help manage that risk and that liability. That being said, you've got to do your due diligence. 
Awesome. Bill? I'll answer a similar question. Uh, what can consumers do in this, uh, in this realm? And I, I think that consumers, unfortunately, liability uh, is, uh, is kind of shifting to software. I mean, yes, software manufacturers are liable, but I think that vendors of, uh, of consumer-grade products should also be liable for, uh, for what they're peddling. And I think that one thing is to, if there's a real damage that's done based on some product that you've bought, then, and they're not held accountable, uh, then to tell your story. There's often uh, public comment periods on the FTC. Uh, FTC had one this year where anyone can write in and tell their story about how they were injured uh, because of a product um, that was uh, compromised. And so a individual could write the F their, you know, FTC, it's a public body that's serving you, you know, the public, and uh, write in saying, hey, this is how I was injured, uh, this is how my data was exfiltrated, et cetera, if you know that this is uh, have, you know, taking place, and uh, write your, uh, your commissioners, the FTC, and say, hey, um, you know, uh, we need to do something about this because, uh, you know, the likes of Amazon are selling products that are known to have vulnerabilities in them and they just don't care. They're just in it for, to make a buck. So, so that's something that, that you can do. Thank you. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess to bring everything full circle, you absolutely can shift cybersecurity liability to vendors and suppliers. You can do this by contractual relationships. You can do this by doing your due diligence. You can do this by making sure that they're complying with, um, you know, commonly accepted industry standards, right? Um, and you can also, you know, help do this by getting particular um, cyber insurance players in the space that can actually help help a company kind of exercise that that shift, right? Because um, it's always better if there's a large corporation banging on their door rather than a small company, right? Um, with that, we have about a minute left. If there's no more questions, then I can give you a minute of your time back. Hey, yeah, thank you. Early.